Muir Wood. Uh, I am a design researcher uh, at, a, at a London uh, tech startup called Judil. I'm also a, a mentor at Google's Launchpad. Um, and I'm going to talk a bit about setting up a design research in, uh, in your business as your business grows. But I'm going to start with a story. Uh, and this story is, is about me. Um, so a couple of years ago, I joined a, a tech startup in London called Dudil, which is uh, it's a, it's a research tool for private company information. It's about five years old now. It's a subscription online tool. Uh, we, we're technically in, in FinTech, which is um, financial technology, not Finnish technology. Um, and I joined us there, head of customer insights, um, which meant I was looking at insights not just about the product, but across sales and marketing as well. And um, the, the company was, was uh, you know, already up and running. We already had customers. Um, we, had a, we had a major segment that we were going after. Um, and so I decided my first task uh, should be to, to set up usability testing in the, in the business. Um, so I built uh, a, a, a really nice little um, UX lab. It had cameras, it had live streaming so anyone could tune into the testing. Um, it had, uh, you could push designs to the, to the, the computer in real time. Um, it was really exciting. I also set up a pipeline of, of uh, participants to come in and, uh, and, and participate in our testing. And uh, everyone got really engaged. People started watching the videos. Uh, the, the product team started doing their own tests. Everything was going really well. But then I did another piece of research and worked out that actually there was another type of customer that was buying our, um, our product that we weren't really aware of that actually paid a lot more for the product uh, and um, churned a lot less. Uh, and so I'd spent all that time optimizing uh, with, you know, the, the product for potentially the, the, the wrong segment. Um, and that's because I'd, I'd gone in and I'd, I'd made some assumptions and I'd been asking the, the wrong questions. Um, and so you know, that got me thinking, why do we, why do, we do that? Why do we, why do we ask the wrong questions? Um, and I think there's a, there's a bunch of reasons some of which were alluded to um, by, by Johnny in the previous talk. Um, you know, we, we make a lot of assumptions about our, our, our users um, all the time. We, you know, even, even after doing research, we, we, we still make assumptions that we're experts on, on, our, on what they need. Um, we often have very, very persuasive senior people um, who can, can Persuade us to, uh, to you know to follow a certain path. They can they can they can tell us that it's the most improb important problem in the world to solve, um, and then you know we think okay fine yeah that seems that se that seems to make sense let's 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 go down that route. Um, sometimes we don't ask questions because we're terrified of what the answer might be uh, on the other side of that question, um, and then a lot of time we're just not really sure how to answer those questions. Uh, you know what's the what's a rigorous kind of scientific way of, of, of getting an answer to that question uh, you know, without, without building it and, and without A-B testing it across you know, all of our 100 million users, um, which, which uh, you know, I'm sure some of you have got a whole bunch of users, but a, a lot of us, especially in early stages and especially in B2B products, um, you never really have a statistically significant volume of users that will allow you to do you know, uh, analytics and use analytics to support very quick decision making. So today, I'm going to talk a bit about, uh, about doing research. Uh, I'm going to talk about all the various aspects of, of, of setting up uh, you know, design research in your business, making sure that you're, you know, you're prioritizing the right questions at the right time. Uh, and also going to um, try and think about how that changes as, as the business grows, as you go from having no customers to, to loads of customers. So what? What should I have done? What should, I, what should have been the first question I asked when I, when I joined, the, joined the business? I came in uh, asking, uh, is my thing easy to use? Can, you know, is it, can the people, can the customers that we're going after right now use it? Uh, and went you know, head first into, into you know, answering that question in as rigorous a way as possible. But actually, the question was, you know, do, do they really need it? Um, are there, you know, are there other people 
uh, who, who might need it more? And are there enough of either of these segments for us to, you know, to, to, to really go all in on that segment and to, you know, to, to, to sell our products to them? And so these questions that you ask are going are gonna to change, uh, and they're going to have different weights and different priorities uh, related to them. Um, so typically, this, this, is kind of this, this table, typically, you know, when you start a business, you're on the far left. Um, you, you know, you're, you're trying to work out you know, whether or not it's an important problem to solve. Um, will people pay to solve that problem? Uh, which is which is critical, and a lot of people don't answer that question. Um, and then you know if it, you know once we've done that and we built a kind of MVP, it just about has to to be good enough to prove that people were going to pay for it. But you know you you really don't need it to to be you know super super optimized. But as as you grow, then the, these questions change. So you know suddenly um, you know people are buying my thing, um, but are they the right people? Are they or are they you know are they just kind of people who like new stuff? Um, and then, you know, later on, you have an abundance of people buying your thing, and they're all saying different things, and, and, and they, they all have different um, needs, and, and it's hard to choose between which ones to, uh, you know, to, to prioritize, and that's, that's a good problem to have. So the, chest, the questions change, and therefore the methods that you use to answer those questions also need to change. But the most important thing is that you, at any time, are prioritizing the scariest question, you know, the, the, you know, you, you, you shouldn't just be doing research for the sake of research. You shouldn't be doing usability because, um, you, you know, you, you know how to do usability. Um, you should be doing it because you, you need to, you, you know, it's the most important question. It's the most important blockage to the growth of your company. So the next thing that I want to talk about is, um, is recruiting participants. The participants for, for research. Often I think, I actually think the biggest reason why people don't research is because it's it's just hard to get r r um, participants and good ones in. Um, oh yeah, if, if you want this, I'm gonna share some books along the way. So um, th these are kind of my recommended reading on each of these topics. Um, I'm also gonna share the slides at the end. Uh, on, I'll, tw I'll tweet them, so don't worry. Um, so finding uh, research participants can be hard, but as I mentioned in the previous slide, if you can't find participants, then you're going to really going to struggle finding customers. Um, so, uh, and especially you know if you're if you're going to be selling, going out selling your your um, your product, then the journey you go on finding participants is quite similar to the journey that your salespeople are going to be going on later on. So it's kind of important to feel that struggle and to understand you know where those people are. And also bear in mind that if you if you build a you know a, a product that has multiple customers, you know you have a uh, you know. A, a, a bunch of free users, but then you sell to advertisers, then you should be researching the, the people who are going to pay for that stuff. You should be researching the advertisers even more than the people that, uh, that are you know, the, the, the users, because ultimately, who's going to pay for it? Um, that, that's where Wally is there on the, on the, um, on the left. Um, another challenge is, um, is just knowing how to uh, reward uh, the, the participants for, for, for their time. Um, it's really hard to know what, you know, what, to, what to, to do, what to give. And the whole process is slow. Uh, and, and often, if you leave it to the last minute, um, it can be an afterthought. And then you end up with uh, you know, crappy participants that, that aren't particularly relevant to your, uh, your product, um, or, they're not, or they're just in it for the pizza, or um, you know, they, just, you know, they just suck. Um, and, then, and then the problem with, at, at, this, at this point, if you, if you start a test with, with poor participants, people lose faith in the test. Uh, people, the other stakeholders in your company are going to be like, well, I never believed in qualitative research anyway. Um, you know, let's just build it and A-B test it. Um, so it's super important to, to, to take this seriously. Um, and and I hear this slide is going to, I'll talk through this slide. I, there's, I think there's different ways of, of getting hold of participants at different stages um, of your business. So to start with, I really recommend not using an agency um, when you're, when you're, pre-launch. Um, so there are recruitment agencies that, that can help you to, to get hold of participants. But if you never feel the, the, the pain of, um, of, of finding them yourself, then, then I don't think you really truly understand your customers. Um, and also, it means that you're, you, you, when you do bring in recruiters later on, as, you're, as you grow and you, and, you run, and you have less time, you have more money, then... Um, hello! Um, uh, yeah, when you do bring in recruiters, you have a much 
tighter definition of who is a good participant and you can brief them much better and you can ride them much harder when they send you shitty participants. Um, so it, it's really important that you do it yourself first. Um, it's hard, you have to go and find those people where, where, you know, where they are. And if, you, if you're selling a business product that, has, um, you know, that, that only lawyers are gonna use, then you're gonna have to find a way to get access to, to lawyers. And you can't, you can't skip this step, you have to speak to lawyers. Um, you can't just say, I'll build it, and then once it's built, then, then I'll show it to them, and then I'll have a reason to talk to them. You have to find a way. Um, so, you know, cold calling, you know, introductions, these kinds of things all work. Then as you get to, to you know, as you, as you start to release a product, you start to have early adopters, you start to have people paying for it and using it, then you have to be, uh, you have to be very careful with, with, with the first people that adopt your product. They, they are super useful for giving you certain types of feedback, but it also, I also find that there's, there's a certain type of person that likes, likes to try new stuff. And they're extremely tolerant of um, usability issues. And they often think in a different way from, from you know, your mainstream users. And so it can be, you know, it's really great to have early feedback and beta testing, but you've also got to be think, like, continuously thinking, how am I, are these the final customers of the product? Or are, is there like, a more mainstream audience that I want to get access to? And how do, I, you know, how do I access them? Maybe I have to go back to some of the pre-launch methods to get access to them. Uh, and then when you have, uh, you have your, uh, you know, your, your your products up and running. You have, you know, have you have volume. You have scale. Then suddenly you have, uh, it gets way cheaper all of a sudden because you have all these channels that you can um, you can use to get access to to your customers. You can you can use so, someone gets in touch about a support query, support so, solves the problem and says, would you mind like coming along to uh, a test? We'll give you some cake, um, and, and you know that person is happy that their problem's been solved. That they're engaged. They're they're a fan of the product. So that's a, a way of getting them in. And likewise with sales. And then you can also use, you can start to use marketing, you can build customer communities. Uh, and, and so it's, it's way easier uh, as, you, as you can imagine. Next up, um, as, you, as, 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 as you all know that um, paying cash can, uh, does cost money. Um, and so you need to find a way when you're incentivizing people to participate in your, in your research, um, you, you need to find a way to kind of detach their time from the price that you pay for their time, especially if you, have, if you want to take up a lot of their time, like two hours or, or, or a week or you know, a, a diary study or, or something, something like that. Um, you, you can't, you, if, especially like let's say going back to the lawyer's example, if you try and pay anything equivalent to what a lawyer would expect for an hour of their time, then you're gonna, you're gonna run out of money quite quickly. So, um, there's a bunch of things that you can do, which are which are, are nice. You can you can give them an Amazon voucher, which which somehow seems different to giving cash. Or you can give them a, a thing like a Kindle or a book or um, you know a, a, a ticket to a to a game or something rare that you have that they don't have. Um, or even you can give a charity donation on their behalf, which is also good for people that can't accept money. Um, you can give you, people need to eat. Uh, and drink coffee and eat cake. Um, so if you know if they're going to be doing that anyway, why not you pay for it? And then um, you know it's way cheaper than giving them a hundred pounds for for their time. Um, and then also sometimes you have something that they that they need that that you have. Some people just like hanging out with startups. Um, so you know it's, you can use what you have available to you, um, to, you know, to to in exchange for an hour of their time. But I think the most important thing, the most important takeaway from, from my experience of doing this participant recruiting for about 10 years uh, is that you need to, to take it seriously from the start. And if you, if you build a process for doing it, if you build a, build a pipeline for doing it, and if it's someone's responsibility at every single stage of the evolution of your company, and so it doesn't feel like it's a chore, then your research becomes really easy. Like this, this is the biggest stumbling block. If, this, if you have people just coming every week, um, like just you've got it, or you've got it automated. You've got um, a calendar set up um, that means that they're just scheduling all the time, or you're, you, you have regular community events. Your support team are giving you a steady flow of people, uh, and and that's part of their job description is to give you those, those people. You're not persuading them to do it. Then then suddenly you know research is easy. You know you, you, any time any argument, you're like, well, we've got someone coming in this afternoon, so let's stop arguing and let's just like whip up a couple of prototypes and test it on this person this afternoon. So it, if you can get that set up, 
uh, as early as possible, then it means it can just resolve so many arguments, so many of the problems, the cultural problems that, um, you know, that happen when it's just some, one person's opinion versus another. And you're like, well, I can't, be, you know, it's, it's a lot of effort to, do, to research it, so, and it seems simple, so let's just go with this person's opinion. But actually, you've got, you got five people coming in this week or two people coming in on Thursday, so just test it. Um, so I think there's really, this, if there's one, the biggest point to take away from this is this, is just get it, make, make it into a habit rather than a chore. Next up, uh, another big challenge that, uh, that often comes with, with researching is that um, it's quite hard to get people to, uh, to be honest. Um, you know, people, I think there's, there's, a, there's a classic book called um, The Mum Tests, which many of you may have heard of. Um, which is about asking questions, how to ask questions so that you, you genuinely work out whether someone concretely needs your thing. Um, jobs to be done is this, is a, a JTBD is, some, is a kind of emerging kind of set of, uh, of techniques for asking questions and then translating those questions into, into you know, product uh, design. Uh, so that these, are, these are good things to look into. But the main issue is that if you ask someone uh, most people, especially if you're, uh, you're early on, it's, it's maybe someone that's trying to help you. Um, the, the people, it's human nature um, not to not to hurt pe other people's feelings, and so the, you you often try and t tell people what you think they want you to hear. And the, the, you know, the ultimate person that would do that would be your mum. You know, if you said to her, "Hey, mum, I've quit my job to um, build this new app. Um, it's it's actually for people like you." Um, it's a recipe uh, discovery tool. It costs $5.99 in the App Store. Um, would you buy it? She's going to be like, of course I'm going to buy it, darling. You're, you know, you're so clever. Well done. You're so brave quitting your job to, to build this thing. Um, so what, what, what the challenge is, um, is like, how are the questions that you could ask your mother, your own, your own dear mother, uh, that would help you to, to work out, to build a case for whether or not... Um, she is in the target market for your product. Um, and and there's, there's a small clue there in um, size 18, uh, which is that you can't just show her the product and ask her if she'd use it, um, because she's probably going to say, oh, yeah, great, yeah, you know, sign me up. Um, so that, that the book, The Mum Test, has, has loads more examples of these kinds of questions. But, um, but there's a couple of kind of categories of, of of questions that I think are really helpful, um, and you can actually you can actually find out everything you need to know without ever even telling her that you quit your job. And it's you know, the fact that you quit your job is probably going to worry her anyway. So maybe just tell her once you've you know you've, you're successful and you're making loads of money out of your recipe book app. Um, so the first one is you know how you know, the, the, the key theme across all of these is that they're all based on a, on, a, on an existing moment, an existing piece of behaviour. Uh, that she can recall because it happened recently. And if it didn't happen recently, then that should be a warning sign that th this is not something that, that she does or care cares about. Um, so asking her how she's currently solving the problem at the moment. You know, how are you finding, how do you find new recipes? How do you, how do you, you know, you're such a wonderful cook, where do you get your ideas from? Um, and then, you know, how often do you, you know, do you, do you look for new ideas? Uh, and then, you know, and uh, you know how how long does it take you to do that? And and you know, do you do you spend any money on on, on finding those ideas? Do you pay for uh, other? Uh, you know, how much do you do you spend on on those ideas? On on those finding those ideas? Um, and then you know, and when and what what are you doing? What you where are you? And and at what time of day? And and uh, you know why? What was it that, that triggered you to to think about uh, finding those recipe ideas? And um, often you might find. I mean, my mum just loves kind of trawling through old recipe books and like she loves the she loves the struggle she loves find you know finding stuff in newspapers she actually it's it's very time consuming but she loves that so um you know she it's actually it's maybe it's like a sort of meditative meditative thing for her so actually she's probably not in the target market so the key is they're all based on real events everything nothing's hypothetical you're not saying if you had a recipe discovery app and it was to give you three recipes per day would that be a thing that you liked and would pay 5.99 for another another great way to uh, you know to, to make it even more real is to is to actually to fake it um, I'm a huge fan of, of what's called concierge prototyping. Um, or, or the Wizard of Ozing, which is kind of similar, and that's where you basically 
you create a kind of very simple front end, uh, and then behind that front end is just you with some things on sticks and and you know a spreadsheet and a phone and uh, doing what it takes to make it feel real to the other person, and ideally, them for them to pay you for that thing. You know, you found out you know, you, f you found out that your you know your mum like really hates finding new recipes and it's a real pain point for her. This is a bad example, but but you know then you say okay fine I'll find you some recipes um, if you give me a fiver right now. Uh, and then you just go on Google and find the recipes for her. That's that's a terrible example, but but maybe if it's someone who who um, you know wants wants Kit Kats delivered to their office, and they would they would pay three times the price of a Kit Kat uh, for that for the, that service, then you can just run it around their office and take the money, and then you have you know one a sample of one person that likes it, and keep doing it until you've got enough and to make to convince you. What, 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 what I'm talking about here is that it's all, con it's all based on concrete actions. So it's a, it's a click of a button that says buy this thing, or it's, a, it's, an, it's an existing behavior that, uh, that, uh, that, that, that you know, people do every day and have actually spent money on. They're aware of the problem and they're paying money to solve the problem. So next up, um, you know, you've done all your, you've done your interviews, you've, you've gathered your data, you've got enormous amounts of footage and, and notes and transcriptions. Um, and it, uh, but it's quite it's often very hard to know how to translate all that stuff into something useful for you know into a design into a physical product um, and a couple of a couple of good resources f for that are um, are the um, the mental models book by uh, Andy Young and also I think this feeds quite nicely into the design sprint methodology from um, from actually from um, Google Ventures um, where, which is all about working together to to kind of Take that data and turn it into into ideas. Um, I'm not going to go through all the methods of, of analysis. Um, I am going to say that if you if there's one tool that you use for analyzing uh, and understanding um, customer behavior and understanding how your product fits into their life and how your product might change their life, it's using an experience map. Um, I, I cannot overstate this. Uh, th th they are the best. Tool. I, I experienced mapped this this presentation I experienced my, my like my mornings um, it's it's just the best way of breaking things down into smaller problems and making sure that you see the context either side of those problems because you know if, if you just if you just looked at the the moment of finding those recipes and didn't think about what was happening before and after and where where she is or when she's finding those recipes you might miss that kind of vital context and you might realize that there's a there's something that happens before which is extremely important so what's an experience map? Um, this is the, the, a lot of, if you Google experience maps, a lot of them are super, but they're built by designers and they're actually really hard to understand and they're very kind of flashy. Um, and this is the best one I found. It's by someone called Harry Brignall. Um, full credit to him for, for making it. Um, it's essentially, you've just break down the, a, a task or an action or a day or a week or a year, whatever is the relevant time frame for your product or service, into a number of steps. And then think about the, the, the categories, uh, the themes that are interesting to you, and then break that, look, at the, look at how those change over each, each of the steps. Um, it's, it's, and then if the themes, you know, keep, keep root testing the themes. Are the themes too big? Are there too many things? Do we need to split this, this, um, sorry, this, the, the step into smaller steps? Should we keep it zoomed out for now and then zoom in on that step later on? It's just a wonderful way of structuring your thought. Um, I love it. I love it the most. Um, the next piece of advice I have is that doing analyzing research on your own is is no fun, and you and it's very slow. Uh, it's quite tiring for your brain, uh, and also you, I think you miss a lot of a lot of great ideas and opportunities. And so it's much better to do it with other people. And if you brought those other people along to the interviews uh, as well, or they've seen the videos, or, they, or they're, they're they're engaged, then then it's, it becomes much more of a, a conversation and a collaboration, and they can see where these ideas that you, you translate them into, you see where they've come from, uh, and, they're, and they're a part of them. And so, uh, you know, so I think that getting help and getting as many people across as many teams as possible to, to help with the, the doing and the analysis of the, of the research and the building of these experience maps or personas or whatever other tools you use um, it is super, super powerful. And, and it actually saves you with what the next step is, which is sharing. Um, sharing, sharing the research is also super important. Everything's super important, but um, if, if, you, if, no one, if, you, if you build um, 
a lovely big thick report um, talking through all of all of the um, you know the, the the wonderful insights you found. No one's going to read it. You can you stick it on a drive and and then people make make bad decisions and you say but there was a PDF on the shared drive and you know it's I I, I emailed it around. I put it on Slack like uh, you know. But it it doesn't it doesn't go down. You need to find you need to innovate and and uh, and kind of user test the way that you you share research and make sure that it's going in. Um, I find that um, you know doing if you know teaching as soon as I learn something about a, a meaningful group of customers, I will immediately stand up at our um, kind of end of week kind of um, beery chats and just just spend five minutes explaining what I've learned this week. And it's a bit like teaching because I'm normally only kind of like five percent further ahead than anyone else in the business in, in understanding a certain thing, but it's great explaining it to other people helps me to understand it, and it just means that um, that you know across the company there's a there's a broader understanding. You need to find ways of 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 sharing research in a way that isn't hard for you because it, you'll as soon as you get busy you'll just stop doing it. Um, so I find that you know you, you you'll find kind of really like kind of quick and dirty ways of, of of explaining it. One of them is what I call the inverse trim, which is at the beginning and end of every single uh, customer interview I I video I always ask the same questions, and then afterwards I, t I have this one hour this unwieldy one hour video which you know has lots of you know relevant stuff that I can go back to later on. But the the first thing I do is take the first five minutes and the last two minutes and I stitch them together. And then I have like a little kind of bite-sized persona video. Or I, you know, sometimes I edit it so it's like 30 seconds. So it's just like, tch, tch, tch. but that means you, I, I have suddenly have these real customers that people can you know can identify with. And it takes me maybe two or three minutes to actually do that that editing, rather than going through the whole video, picking out insights, grabbing stills, grabbing frames, and then trying to edit together a bigger meaningful uh, piece of work. Another thing I I like to do. Uh, is, is make tiny posters and stick them in the in the bathroom cubicles of the business. I call them insights, and um, they they just have like small bits of uh, customer information. And uh, so when when you're relieving yourself, you can just get informed about uh, our customers, what their needs are, you know, certain trends, industry trends that are emerging. Um, and finally. Um, it is okay to repeat. Like, you know, you, you think you, you think it's gone in because you've said it in a compelling way, um, but people, everyone has other stuff on. Like everyone, when you're talking, everyone's on their laptop. Like this guy here. Um, you know, they, they're 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 thinking about a million other things. So you can't assume that you've when you've when you've explained what your customers need, want, why they behave in a certain way. You can't assume that it's gone in at all. You have to keep going over and over, and it's, it feels painful because we're all smart people. But everyone's got other more important things going on. So you've got to repeat it. So you've got to repeat it. You've got to repeat it. Um, so yeah. So this 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 is the, the the final point is that you know everyone needs to uh, you know sharing is so important because everyone across the business needs to needs to get, gain empathy uh, to understand the, the the problem. So and hopefully I've given you some ideas for for you know quick and painless ways of of doing that. So just to recap, um, when you're planning, make sure you, you're you're answering the the riskiest uh, assumptions when you when you when you translate them into into your kind of research methods. Um, don't just do the ones that are easy to research. Um, build a recruitment pipeline as early as possible so that it just becomes a habit. So you're just it's just happening constantly. Um, Prioritize concrete behavior uh, to make you make sure that uh, everything is based on real world events. Um, get as much help as you can. Um, you know w when you're doing research and analyzing it uh, because that helps with the, that helps with the sharing and also experience maps of the shit. Um, and when you're sharing, um, make sure that everyone is understands it. And you can test that. You can then you can do you can go out a week later and say so. What what is it what what is it about our customers that you know that, that make, means they they love our product? And if, if they can't answer that question, then you failed in your sharing. So you need to repeat more. So, final thought: what um, what question are you answering at the moment in your business? Thank you. Do I, do I have time for questions? Yes, I have time for questions. Does anyone have any questions? If not, if you're shy. Then I'm going to be over there, um, and I can, we can talk more about uh, any of this stuff, any kind of techniques, concierge prototyping, um, or just 
things to do in Helsinki. Um, thanks a lot. <laughs>